Um, quick question, AJ. I thought, like, faith, like, the seed of faith was always in, in us, like, so it's, it wasn't, because, like, in my experience, I always had some sort of faith, but, uh, like... <clears throat> but like I just said, Fab, for a lot of us, here we are sitting on earth, we have a spirit guide who has faith because they have had a personal experience. And all they're doing is telling us, you can do this, you can do this. They're trying to encourage you to do it for yourself, but until you do it for yourself, faith won't really exist. Right? All that's happening is you're being influenced by someone who's, posit who's a positive influence on you, and they're showing you that it's possible. So when you come along to these discussions with me, all I'm doing is trying to show you that it's possible. Does that make sense? But I can't do it for you. Because nobody can. Even God cannot do it for you because to do so, God would have to break the law of free will. So even God cannot do it for you. You are the only person that can do it for you. There are so many qualities, actually, within you that you have the potential to develop that only you can develop through a process. And only you can do it. Nobody else can do it for you. So many of us want everyone else to do it for us. We're addicted to other people doing lots of things for us. We, that's, what we, that's how we live our lives most of the time. So I was saying to Graham in the break, Graham came up, and you don't mind me mentioning Graham, um, came up and he was asking me about why he, he wasn't feeling God, right? Feeling God's love entering, in, entering him, even though he believes that God exists and so forth. And I described it as like this. Most of us have these holes within us, right? These holes, let's call them a hole full of pain, right? And what we have is we want the pain to go away. So we choose all sorts of methods for the pain to go away. And one of the methods is we project out to other people, please make my pain go away. And they then give us a feeling that makes our pain go away. Now that's called an addiction. Does that make sense? And you know what most of us expect from God? We expect God meets our addictions. So in other words, what we want in a relationship with God is when we're longing for God's love, we're not really longing for God's love most of the time. What we're longing for is for God to make our pain go away. Is that not true? You think of how many times you've actually prayed to God in your life. Most of the time, isn't it when you're longing for God to make your pain go away? Right? Now, the beautiful thing about God is that God never feeds your addictions. So, this is the main reason why other people will come along, by the way, and feed them, but God will not. What God wants is for you to get to that pain... And get rid of it. So when you have faith and you really long for God's love, God's love starts entering you and then the pain is exposed, not covered over. It's exposed. Now many of you, when you start having your pain exposed, what do you do? You try to cover it back over. Right? And that shuts down the entire process. Right? And because you do not have any faith that the pain can be released, you want God to make the pain go away. In other words, you want God to enter an addiction with you. And God's going, no, no, no. I'm not entering any addictions with you. I would like you to let go of this pain that's like your big black hole so that it's no longer there anymore, and trust that when you do this, I'll be with you, helping you through this process with you. Right? But most of us don't want to do that. So what we do is we finish up doing this, putting the, we, we start having the pain exposed, and we want the layer back. So we try to get the layer back. When we get the layer back, we pro close down the process. When we close down the process, we no longer are experiencing divine love. Experiment with that. Experiment next time. Next time, instead of going, God, I want you to get rid of my pain, instead of doing that, go like this. God, I want, to help, want you to help me feel my pain. 
and see how much love you received during that process in comparison with the processes that you've already been having. Do the experiment. All, right? All we need to do is do the experiment. If we do the experiments, you will find that the way God does everything is with pure intention. So, so what happens then is if I have this feeling of wanting God's love, which is prayer, and I do not receive it, I know there's something in me blocking it. Right? And I know that it's got to be something about my pain because that's where I always try to put a cover over. I know that for sure. And so what I would like to do with you now is talk about some of these things that we need to have faith in if we're truly going to engage this relationship with God. So now I'm not talking about the faith that we can have generally about physical things, generally about laws, you know, physical laws. Now I'm starting to talk about the, the real big law, the universal law of divine love and how you can go through the experiment by having some faith, faith in some basic things about that law. Does that make sense? So let's go through them. Now, of course, the things that you have faith about, you don't necessarily know are true at this point. It's just a faith that you're going to experiment with until such a point that it's demonstrated that it's true to you. So if we're talking about a relationship with God and receiving divine love, what do you think logically is the very first thing to experiment with? Any ideas? From a logical perspective, if we go... Back up to Jason up back there. Uh, have some faith that God actually wants or desires to have a relationship with you. Yeah, I'd put that down around four or five, probably. It's, that's number one. Alex, you want to have a go? Then we come down. Um, desire. Yeah, I'd put that even further down, actually. <laughs> Um, if we go, let's go, let's go behind. That God exists. Ah, that is a big one, is it not? How can you have a relationship with a God that you don't believe exists? I'd say that's pretty hard myself. It's like saying, I, like, so me saying that joy doesn't exist. How can I ever have a relationship if I don't believe joy exists with joy? Impossible. Right? So, so this is the very first thing to experiment with, don't you think? This is the very first thing to concentrate some effort on. Does God exist or not? It's a big question. Right? There are certain things that I can do to find out whether God exists, but it's worth answering that question first, isn't it? Okay. What's a, so having some faith that there is the potential that God exists and then making some experiments that might prove to yourself that God actually does exist would be a great way to start. All right? So forget about the you know, religious indoctrination you've had in the past. Forget about the religions and what they believe about it all. Forget about all of those different things. Focus on, firstly, on this thing. Do you feel inside of your heart that God exists? And if you don't, how can you ever have a relationship with a God that doesn't exist? Impossible. So to you, it, whether God really exists or not, it's immaterial. If God doesn't exist to you, you're never going to have a relationship with God. All right? so, so firstly, we need to start looking at whether God exists. What's next, do you think? Fab. God, God loves. God loves. Do you know what? This is where most religions on earth have already failed. Point number two. Most religions on earth believe what about God? That God is angry, punishing, will destroy the wicked, destructive, and so forth and so forth. All of those things are not about love. Already the test of most religions has failed because, in regard to faith because they haven't established a faith in a God of love. To be honest... The majority of you have yet to establish a faith in a God that loves. It's not that easy establishing that kind of faith, you know. 
Why is that? Because the day-to-day life that we have, we often feel like we've been tormented or punished for something and all these other feelings that we have. And so we don't see it, we don't see it as it truthfully is necessarily. So in the end, we start thinking that maybe God's this angry God like my daddy was, you know, who punishes me every time I step out of line and only rewards me when I do the right thing. That's how we see God. That's not a God of love. What we're seeing is a God, what I would call an, auto, auto, an autocratic God. Right? We're not seeing a God of love. We're seeing a God of rule, of iron, usually. And these, all of these Bible concepts, are, you know, that Jesus would come and destroy the wicked. Right? And God will bring the great day of the war of God the Almighty to the earth. Right? All of those kind of concepts. And that's actually a quotation from the Bible, believe it or not. That God is a God of war and will actually bring destruction to the earth. There is a Christian belief from many Christians that they believe that the earth will be burned with fire in the last days. Mass murder. That's the God they believe in. A, a ma- mass murderer. God is no such thing. right? And if we can't accept a God of love, how could you ever ask for love from God? Now, the majority of us have huge blockages to understanding that God is a God of love. And if we just have some faith, so if we went, right, okay, I'm going to at least even start with some intellectual concept in there. Oh, that sounds a bit woody. And uh, (laughs) an intellectual concept, right, that, that God does Love. And whenever I feel that God does not love, I might be out of line with that concept. Would be a great place to start. Right? What would you say would be the next thing? Three? You want to have a stab, Graham? Okay. Just leave your hand up so I can see you. God wants to have a relationship with me personally. Yeah, I'd put that down here somewhere. Yeah. What's the structure in which you live? Here's your clue. Uh, Joy? Use the, use the mic. Um, that God did create everything in the universe. Okay, which means that God created what? Me. Now, before the universe could exist, something well, had to exist. He created the laws. Yeah, there had to be a structure in which the universe could exist in order for the universe to exist. The structure is the laws. So... Here's number three. God's laws are loving. If we had some faith that God's laws are loving, you know, we would be very circumspect about our lives if we had some of that faith. We'd be looking, every time we have a negative event, we be going, well, there's a law involved here that, that's caused this negative event to be a part of my life. There's got to be something in me that attracts these events and, uh, and that causes... There's some law that's in operation here causing these events. If we trusted that, we would believe that, if we had faith in that. Most of us don't have faith in that. You know, for most of us, you know what we do? We go, something bad happened. God's a bastard. They even call things that happen acts... Of God. Uh, the whole insurance industry has it all written in legal terms about acts of God. Who's an insurance broker here? Isn't that not true? Isn't, yeah? Isn't it true? The acts of God. All in legal terminology, yes? This, uh, this presumption that mankind has that anything that bad happens must be God's fault. And many of us have this emotion inside of us about our personal lives. Anything that bad happens must be somebody else's fault and ultimately it must be God's is the underlying viewpoint that we have. Now that is going to stop you from ever wanting a relationship with God if you believe that. Why would you want a relationship with a God who's a mongrel and makes terrible laws? <laughs> it's like saying, oh, I want to have a relationship with Stalin because he's such a nice fellow. Like, you know. Well, Stalin was a mass murderer, yes? Well, God's a far worse mass murderer, according to the Bible. At one time in the Bible history, it says that God destroyed everyone except for seven people. 
So that, isn't that what you'd call a mass murderer? Now, if you believe in a God like that, do you think you're going to want to have a relationship with them? Or do you just think you'd be scared? <laughs> what do we say in Australia? <laughs> scared shitless about having a relationship. And this is why most people in the world are totally frightened of God. Because there's these concepts of God that are almost in every religious faith. Do you, do you know on the planet at the moment there are 2.2 billion Christians, right? There's about 1.9, I think it is, billion Muslims. If you add up the religious face, it turns out that I think it's about 84% of people on the planet actually have a religion. The majority of people do have a concept that there is a God that exists, so they have no trouble with number one. But the problem is number two and number three. They have no concept that there is a God of love that exists or a concept that all of God's laws are loving. Now, how can you expect to ever want a relationship with a God that has no love for you and is willing to punish you until hell freezes over, as the saying goes? It's going to be very, very hard for you to want a relationship with such a person, I would suggest. And, and there is this constant thought that God is arbitrary in the way that God delivers punishment. In other words, God decides, oh, I like that fellow, I'll let him get away with murder. I don't like that fellow very much. You know, He's just got to swear and I'm going to punish him. <laughs> there is this concept that people have on this earth that God is arbitrary in the way in which God delivers justice. Right? If we believe these things, that would not be possible. There is also these concepts of like some religions view themselves as more important than others. They see themselves as we're the ones who are saved. Yeah? Now, if God loves all of her children, who's God interested in saving? All of her children. <laughs> Does that not make sense? Not just the children who have a certain intellectual concept or a belief system or a doctrinal structure, but rather children who just want to have a relationship with God. And, and God would want to save even the ones that don't want to have a relationship with God. And in fact, God has a whole way of saving such people. Right? But most of us don't believe it. Most of us don't believe any of those things. Because we've grown up in an environment, in a family environment generally, where sooner or later somebody punished us whenever we got out of line, and they rewarded us whenever we were in line. And so that's what we think God is. A person who rewards us and punishes us depending on whether we're out of line or in, in line or out of line. That's what we believe. Igor? Uh, wouldn't it be important to clarify that there is one true God? Yeah, well, that's what I'm speaking of here when I say one God exists. There can only be one, I would suggest. If there is one at all, there only can be one. Um, not hundreds of thousands of millions of them. Right? There is one supreme being who was the source of all things. If there was ever such a being, there has to only be one. If uh, we believe there's hundreds of thousands of gods, then my suggestion is sooner or later you'll find behind the, all of those gods there is one <laughs> who all of those people or all of those gods accede to. But again, you don't have to make the assumption. You can do the experiment. Try to believe in a hundred thousand gods and try to connect with every one of them and see where it takes you. And see whether that takes you in the same direction as connecting to one of them and seeing where that takes you, the one that's supreme. We can make an experiment of every single thing. Every single thing. But it's a personal experiment. No amount of somebody talking to you is going to convince you unless you go through your own experiments. Right? Now, you can get together and share your experiments with others and they go, oh, that's a good experiment. I'll try that too. You could easily do that. But in terms of telling someone the results of your own experiments, then all you're doing is doing what I'm doing. <laughs> and it's not very effective, is it? Have you, have you seen that? How many of you have had the personal experiment that you know for certain you've received divine love after five years of listening? How many of you know? That's not a large percentage, is it? 
Right? So having someone tell you doesn't make much difference. It's only when you engage the experiment that things will change. Yep. What else could we have faith in? So we talked about God being exists. Many of us here have flirted with that one and sort of have a tick on it. Would you say that? Many of us here are not so certain about this one or this one. In fact, on a daily basis, I hear many of you cursing one of God's laws called the law of attraction. You don't like that law very much at all. Right? So that, that's, that's not a belief that God's laws are loving, is it? Right. And in fact, the majority of us still are flirting with the idea or concept that there is a loving God. And I can understand why, because for, historically, for tens of thousands of years on this planet, there is the underlying idea and concept that's been prevalent and that is that God is a punishing wrathful God who destroys people that we've got to sacrifice for years ago they used to sacrifice their own children the firstborn of their own children for this God and they felt that whenever they did that they would have a good harvest, they'd have a good life for the next year and so forth right? what's the difference between that and the sacrifice of Jesus for God? Not much. It's now one person sacrificing his life for God. Does God require a sacrifice at all? No. But many of you believe you are sacrificing every day still with your relationship with God. So that means you still believe it, that God requires sacrifice. You see, just because you're told something, it doesn't mean that anything changes here in your heart. You can be told thing after thing after thing the truth even, facts about God, and not believe them. Right? You're only going to believe them when these start to become your personal experience with God. And the only way you're going to do that is to, to have a personal experience with God. And that's completely independent of anybody else that's ever lived or ever will live. There are things people can do to help you. They can tell you the truth of their own experience, but even that is not going to convince you. Something inside has to change before you'll be convinced to, to try the experiments. Let's go for another thing we need to have some faith in. So now we're starting to get down. This is, this is about God universally, is it not? What we've written there. Now let's look at God personally, as some of you have already raised. So what was one of the ones that you mentioned, Graham, that God loves me? Now, can you see that if I believed that, the only thing limiting my belief of that is whether I feel I am lovable. Does that make sense to everyone? Is that how I spell lovable? No, it's not. Can you see that? Can you see that if, if I actually knew that God was a God of love in my heart, then the only reason why I would not believe that God loves me is because I feel that I'm unworthy of being loved. Right? And even then, it would be a challenge, wouldn't it? If you, if you accept that, then you surely would have to accept this. Yeah. So on that, on that um, thought... If, if I had a, a feeling that, you know, God just slipped off on the assembly line on that day and made me a bit faulty. Made a faulty mould. Yeah, just, yeah. Just for you. Just for me, because yeah, I'm yeah. special. Yeah, God's um, an idiot sometimes, eh? He just has a day off, bang, look what happens. <laughs> it was that seventh day that he rested, you know. The seventh um, day he so, rested. So... You were made on the seventh day that he rested. <laughs> Who made you then? Exactly. 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 Um, so that would come under... Um, believing God is a God of love, who is perfect. It's the exactly. same kind of thing. Yes, right. Okay. exactly. You know, and this is, I feel, um, one of the things... That we could even put that above here. We could even put it here, like, God is perfect. Yeah, God is perfect. Okay. But let's globalise it and, and say what we're seeking for is what are God's attributes and qualities... And one of those attributes is perfection. Or infallibility, I guess they call it too, don't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah pure infallibility. 
yeah, perfection. See, no, none of us will ever have that. We all seem to think we will at some point, but we won't. Because we're continually growing towards God, right? So God is the one that has it, and we, we can get more and more and more, become more perfect. But whenever you expect yourself or someone else to be perfect, you're way out of line with God. Because only God's perfect. And we can approach perfection. You must become perfect, as your Heavenly Father is. But at the end of the day, we must and not acknowledge God's attributes and qualities at some point. We need to know what they are. It's like, how can you have a relationship with someone that you don't know what they are and don't even trust what they are? Right? So these are still universal issues before we even get down to... And I'd like to put a few more universal issues that probably none of you are ever going to come up with. Do you want me to tell you? Yes. Okay. I told you none of you, yes. Sir. <laughs> the reason why I bring it up, though, is because I've had a personal experience with God, a personal experience that many of my brothers and sisters in the spirit world have also had. And when I talk to you about God, I'm talking to you about God's, that God exists, that God is a God of love, that God's laws are all loving. I'm telling you about God's qualities and attributes. And what I'm saying to you too is, you can trust me with it. Right? You can trust a lot of these things. When I say that I'm giving you a personal opinion, so when I say that, so you know when you, talk, when you ask me questions about earth changes and other things like that, I say I'm giving you a personal opinion. Right? Don't trust that. <laughs> you follow me? Because it's just my personal opinion. It's, it's as much value as your own personal opinion. And I'd say that's next to no value at all, just like mine. <laughs> but when it comes to divine, the divine, the experience, the experience that we've had, now you can trust that. You can trust these truths. Do you, do you understand? And many of you don't trust me yet. You know how I know? Because you haven't started the experiment yet. The experiment with God I'm talking about. If you trusted me, and you, like many of you have come along for five years listening, and why, why are you doing that? Because you like what you hear a lot of the times, right? That's why you do it. But you don't like it enough yet to do the experiment. But it's only the experiment that will give you the faith and then the certainty. Right? And I, I, rem I wanted to remind you that what I'm talking about here can be trusted. And that's a universal thing. There's a lot of people on this earth who have based their belief systems, 2.2 billion people on this planet, have based their belief systems on some things that they thought I said 2,000 years ago, that I did not say. All right? I'm suggesting to you, if you're going to have any faith at all in God, Trust what I'm saying to you about God. You don't have to trust me necessarily, although in the end you're going to have to come to trust me sometime. You're going to listen to me for five years. What's the point of doing that if you don't trust me, right? But at some point you're going to have to believe that I am trustworthy. You're going to have to accept that at some point. And when I say have to, I don't mean that you have to, forced to. I'm saying that sooner or later what I'm saying about God you'll have to come to see as being true if you really want to have any faith. Now, most of you are still resisting that quite a lot, right? So when I talk about a loving God, you're there inside going, oh, I don't like God at all. Look what God's done in my life, you know. There's so much rage inside a lot of time. We had a lovely chat, myself and Igor, about this, and Igor said, you know, I just realised the other day I've got so much anger about God. I just need to tell God God's a bastard and get it out of my system, right? And to be honest, that's how many of you need to do things first. You need to let go of this pain that is inside of you through this experience that you've had that's been out of harmony with love and truth where you've believed things in the past about God that are completely false but you've accepted them so much so that you lived your life by them for a long period of time and had a lot of pain as a result. 
and you're going to have to let that go somehow emotionally if you're ever going to have a relationship with this God of love. Yeah? So I'm saying you can trust me and, and sooner or later everyone on this planet if they want to have a relationship with God are going to have to trust somebody who already has a relationship with God. <laughs> right? And the reality is there's lots of celestial spirits now who have a relationship with God and, uh, and all of them are trustworthy. Okay, so once we've got through all of that, can you see that the desire for God, or should we call it what it really is, a longing for God, which is, if we want to define that as well, prayer, would be natural, would it not? If you fully understood everything about God, uh, even before you understand yourself, if you fully understood everything about God, would you not want to have a relationship with this God if a re such a relationship was possible? Well, I, I would suggest that we would. Now, below that, there are many other things that we need to start having faith about. For example, and, and, and may I say, they all revolve around yourself and your own capacity. <laughs> You need to have some faith that you can change. You need to have some faith that you can become more loving. You need to have some faith that if you give up your addictions, you're going to be happier, not sadder. Does that make sense? There's a lot of personal things that you need to develop faith about that are all a part of finding out the truth, the actual facts about the laws of divine love. We need to have some faith that when I ask for love and don't receive it, that it must be something going on with me. Because it certainly wouldn't be anything going on with a God of love who's perfect, who made perfect laws that govern how the operation of love works. It has to be me that's blocking that all. And I need to have faith in that, that it is me, that I have the power through my will to change the future of my existence if I engage this faith. So I need to start having some faith in myself. right? So many of you are willing to start engaging some faith in God and at the same time you're still trying to avoid any faith in yourself. Right? You can't do that. Not and obey the laws of divine love, which are the highest laws in the universe. Exactly. So when, when you guys think of me as AJ, have you noticed that you can trust me more? Isn't that interesting? I find that interesting. But when you think of me as Jesus, you start thinking you can't trust me at all. Can you see the problem? This is the problem we've had with the growth of divine truth. Is as soon as I say to a person who I am, most people run away. Like people would tell you, media, the media wants to say that they that they come to me because I'm saying who I am. No, most people, it's the opposite. My personal experience has been the opposite of that. Most people who hear me say I'm Jesus, you remember the very first time I said to you that I was Jesus? Some of you were present, remember in Peter's hall there, that Peter's got on the side of his house, on that very first time that I said it publicly, it was six or six, yeah, five and a half years ago. Some of you were there, right? Yeah? And you remember the feeling? I remember Mary told me that she was just going, no, no, don't say it, don't say it. <laughs> I wasn't even there. I was watching the DVD. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right? and, and this is the thing is if, if I had just said, oh, my Jan, I'm going to tell you these truths, many of you might have accepted them by now. But because, because I'm saying I'm Jesus, many of you still have a large problem with accepting them. And I'm saying to you, if you can at least see my character is trustworthy you would at least start the experiment. I'm not asking to have anything from you aside from start the experiment. And I'm not even asking that from you. I've been willing to do that. Many of you have yet to engage the experiment and I've talked to you for five years. Surely by now you'd realise that I don't have much investment in you doing it. <laughs> right? <laughs> like I've, I just present material, present material. That's all I'm doing to you. And hope, hoping that at some point in the time there'll be, an, there'll be a spark of faith inside of your soul 
that causes you to engage the experiment. All right? And I feel a part of this experiment is the, the next thing I'd like to talk to you about, and that is, if we put it as number six, is the truth about the human soul. In the process of engaging the experiment with God, you will come to have some faith in the human soul. You will have faith that you have a soul and that you are one half of it. And all of these other teachings that I've taught you, at the moment the majority of you still have no faith in these particular things. Right? They're just intellectual concepts that you've been presented with. And there's not been a personal engagement of them because there's not a personal engagement with God. So this is what I would like to leave you with tonight. Make a personal list of the things in which you know you don't have faith. So instead of trying to run away from them all, face them. Make a list of all the... Ways in which you don't have faith. Starting with God. And be honest with yourself about it. Really brutally honest with yourself about it. And then when you see that list, have faith that you can get answers to every single one of these issues you have with regard to God and your own self and your own life. Now, I suggest to you that if you have that kind of faith, the next thing that you will do is, is act. You will no longer be putting off actions. You will no longer be waiting for someone else to do it for you. You will no longer be reliant on someone else including Jesus, to do it for you. You will wish to engage a personal relationship with your own parent, God, because you start to have some faith that there are going to be benefits, personal benefits in your own interaction with God. Does that make sense? At the moment, many of us do not believe this. And that's why we are addicted to doing all the things we're doing on the planet, on the earth, addicted in our relationships with other people, because we're so focused on getting all of these things met through those addictions, because we don't want to go through this experience with God for lots of different reasons. And what I'm suggesting for you to do as a, as a high priority is to note down the areas where, where faith is lacking and start developing some experiments where you can figure out how to get some faith in those areas. Right. So you want to first know where faith is lacking and then you want to make some experiments for yourself that nobody else has control over that you are willing to engage because you want to experience your own life rather than rely on other people to experience your life for you. So once that happens, once you start this experimenting process, and my suggestion would be to experiment with all of these truths about God first. And then you can forget that one as well. Experiment with all these truths about yourself next. That would be my suggestion to you. And faith is going to be a key part in dragging you through all of those experiences. Right? And it will also provide joy. Like It's very rare that you see me in a down and out condition, is it not? Right? Now, I do cry. But I cry as the result of receiving love, having the pain exposed and letting the pain come up when I'm receiving it. I don't cry in just because I'm frustrated and I didn't understand this law and I didn't understand that law and what's going on and all those kind of things. Very, now it's unheard of for me to cry in those particular areas because I've found that all I need to do is receive love 
and all of these pains will come out of me. And I'm suggesting to you to trust that same process. Receive the love and all of these painful things, allow the experience of all of these painful things that will come out of you. It'll come out of you if you let it. If you don't let it, it'll stay in you and you'll be like this bottled up person, frustrated that you're trying to receive love, frustrated that your faith isn't growing into full confidence, into full awareness, into full trust. And five years' time, we'll be talking about this and you'll be going, yeah, I don't know if God exists still. And that would be a shame. And it doesn't matter what happens to me, it'd still be a shame for you if to come down five years later and say, I still don't know if God exists yet. It would be much better if you knew for certain one way or the other. And if you feel for certain that God doesn't exist, then try that as an experiment. 